Hey everyone, welcome back to our SFI bi-weekly briefing on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Uh, I'm Sarah Strader, Executive Director of Secure Families Initiative, and today I have a co-presenter, Janessa. Hey, Janessa. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Janessa. I'm currently uh, stationed in Monterey, California with my partner. Uh, I've been volunteering with SFI for almost a year now, uh, which is kind of exciting. So, so happy to be here and to um, share some updates with the community. Thanks, Janessa. All right, folks, today we've got four stories that we're following. Afghanistan, Iraq, electronic voting, and the COVID vaccine. So hang in there. Um, item number one is uh, Afghanistan. As you can tell um, by all of our, our tones today, um, as many of our members in our community have seen the headlines, um, things, are, things are not going well right now. Um, so just a, a quick recap of where things are so far. Um, after capturing much of the country's provincial capitals, over the weekend, the Taliban marched into the national capital of Kabul and initiated negotiations with the Afghan Defense Forces to take over the city and federal power. Afghan President Ghani uh, has fled the country. He did so on Sunday. Meanwhile, the United States is in the process of evacuating U.S. diplomats and Afghan allies who are holding special immigrant visas. Uh, about 8,000 American troops who were already forward deployed in CENTCOM have since been mobilized to support those evacuation efforts. Uh, and while the airport had paused flights yesterday, uh, we've been told that they have since resumed outbound flights this morning. Uh, and I understand that American troops on the ground are in communication with nearby Taliban commanders trying to prevent uh, future security incidents throughout the evacuation. Um, so that's the best update that we've got so far on things. But, you know, I just want to start by saying the obvious. All of this news and developments uh, are grim and they're hitting members of our community in all different sorts of ways. Yesterday, SFI released a statement which included some resources for veterans and military families who are particularly affected right now. So. I just want to start by saying I really encourage folks to check out those resources if uh, you are someone who needs support in processing uh, a lot of this news right now. Um, in that statement, we also gave some uh, immediate action items that members can take to support uh, the evacuation efforts uh, and Afghan refugees who may be coming into the United States. Um, one of those examples is to donate either um, money or space uh, to your local refugee resettlement agency. So if you're interested in doing that, you can find a link to that on our statement. In addition to that broad kind of opportunity to help, I also do want to mention if you have personal contacts who are in Afghanistan right now, Afghan nationals, for example, who are looking to evacuate uh, and need help, we do have some more specific resources to help individuals. Um, so please direct message one of us and we will connect you with those resources uh, and give you give you some support. Yeah, thanks for that, Sarah. I just wanted to add, as Sarah mentioned, uh, what's happening on the ground right now is impacting our community in many different ways. And it can be especially hard for those of us who still have contacts um, in Afghanistan or, or who are watching from afar and so and trying to find ways to help. So I would also encourage um, if you have a strong connection or if there's people, there are people that you're trying to support, please contact your members of Congress to either let them know what you would like to see happen and how you would like them to use their voice to make changes or also let them know if there are in specific individuals that you would like the uh, help getting onto evacuation lists um, and see how to how to support in that way. So definitely reach out to your members of Congress and reach out to each other for support. Uh, and, you know, it's just there are a lot of people within this community, both the military community, foreign policy communities who are trying to mobilize and support right now. So uh, as Sarah said, let us know if, if you're looking for direct resources we can connect you to. Thank you, Janessa. That's a great addition. Uh, and just to quickly wrap up this topic, um, you know, in future episodes, we are definitely going to dedicate time to discussing uh, the withdrawal, both the decision and the implementation of this policy. Uh, and so we, we will get into that in kind of future episodes. But for now, I just want to make very crystal clear that every to every military family member watching right now, this rapidly changing situation on the ground in Afghanistan does not change at all the fact that your service mattered. Uh, I want you to know that every single person who has sacrificed something in support of this mission uh, needs to be proud of their contributions. So, you know, no matter what kind of future policy discussions happen, nothing is going to change that. And I just wanted to kind of set that tone from the outset. So, 
Um, thanks, everyone. And please continue to contact us if you have any questions or if we can uh, be a source of support. Moving on in our briefing, item number two for today, uh, the 2002 AUMF repeal has a pathway to law. So we've talked a lot about AMS before, uh, just a quick recap, the 2002 authorization to use military force uh, is the authorization that sent us into the Iraq war. Uh, it's an authorization that's no longer relevant or necessary for ongoing military operations. And in fact, keeping it on the books uh, actually leaves a dangerous open door for presidents to send our troops into a war uh, without congressional approval. Um, so earlier this summer, there was a repeal bill that passed the full house. Uh, and now the Senate has passed their version of that bill out of committee. So this is good news because that means we're only one Senate floor vote away from finally sending this bill to the president's desks. Um, and, and related positive news, this bill is advancing at the same time as our military mission in Iraq has reached an important milestone. Uh, in July, we formally transitioned from being an actively fighting force into an advisory and support force. Uh, and that's hugely significant. It indicates how far our mission there has come. Uh, and I think the timing of that actually lends additional support uh, to repealing this authorization that we don't need anymore. Great. Thanks for that update, Sarah. I have the third item on our list today, which is electronic voting bill for military service members. Um, Senator Tammy Duckworth introduced Senate Bill 2328, known as the Reducing Barriers for Military Voters Act last month, which would allow all active duty service members to cast their ballots electronically while they are stationed in hazardous duty zones overseas. Um, currently, each state makes its own determination on whether to allow electronic voting for overseas military members. Um, those might be people who aren't able to access a printer or have unreliable mail service while they're overseas um, in hazardous duty zones. And so that would allow them to continue to vote electronically. Um, currently, 40 states not 40, 24 states do allow electronic voting for military members, um, and, uh, but it is up to each individual state right now. So SFI was proud to endorse this new legislation, uh, which enjoys a wide range of bipartisan co-sponsors. Um, Congressman Joe Wilson introduced uh, his House version of the bill back in May, and the Senate version of the bill is currently in review by the Co Committee on Rules and Administration. Uh, though the Senate did adjourn for summer recess and won't return until next month, so we probably won't be hearing any updates on the bill until then. But the introduction in both chambers is, is itself a, a positive step. And just to quickly add one thing, you know, the behind this bill is the empowerment of the DOD to uh, in, invest in creating a system to make this universally uh, available. Um, each individual state will still be, it, it will be up to them to choose whether to opt into the system or not. So um, there will be a long future of state level advocacy to get it universally adopted. Um, but, you know, baby steps, we'll take, we'll take it where we're at. Great. And then the fourth item on our list today is the COVID vaccine is possibly becoming mandatory for service members soon. And we have most of us have received emails or seen the updates in the past few weeks uh, that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin announced last week that he plans to make the COVID-19 vaccine mandatory for service members by mid-September or whenever the FDA authorizes full approval of the vaccine, uh, whichever comes first. So the Pfizer vaccine is expected to receive full authorization from the FDA uh, in early September. So we'll be tracking for updates on when that announcement is made. And um, Secretary Austin is encouraging all service members and civilian contractors um, to get the vaccine now rather than waiting until the mandate in September. Yeah, that's a, a significant update, Janessa. I know COVID isn't, hasn't necessarily been an issue that we've touched on in these briefings to date, but certainly it is relevant to national security. Uh, and this felt like a big enough update that we wanted to make sure uh, members were, were uh, understanding of it. Yeah, and just to, uh, in, in case you're wondering how many people are vaccinated within the military community, um, within, within active duty service members, about 62% are fully vaccinated, and current numbers have about 73% have received at least one dose. So this would be adding to the 17 vaccines that are already mandated, mandated for service members, depending on their different lo location of assignment. Um, so we will definitely bring you updates as we hear any formal announcement on the date. Thanks, Janessa. 
So at the end of every briefing, we try to leave you with at least one action item. Uh, this week we have two. So the first action item we encourage folks to do is please read and share SFA statement on Afghanistan, which we released yesterday, uh, because included in that statement, in addition to words of support, are, are action items related to both supporting uh, Afghan evacuees and supporting uh, our friends and family in the military community. Right, and then second, uh, if you've got some issues on your mind that you want to raise with your members of Congress, look to see whether they're hosting a town hall in your local district that you can attend while they're on their recess, uh, summer recess. And we have a guide on our website that can help you get in touch with them and share your opinions. Thanks to everyone for tuning in to uh, our biweekly brief this week. We hope to have um, happier tones and news in the future, but for now, uh, we're just grateful to, to be able to have this opportunity to share information as we as we get it with our members. Please tune back in in two weeks from now. That's August 31st for those of you tracking uh, with the next update on ending endless war, reducing domestic militarism and defending military family access to voting. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>